Hello everyone, I'm the last talker. I'm amazed by the things I've heard before and yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a beautiful line going through. Uh, I was like checking, I was playing bingo, I was like, oh damn, I also have one of those slides. Oh god, transportation, god, I have to mention this from a different angle and so on. Really great stuff. I hope that I'll draw another line in here and, and accommodate the things that have been said already about artificial intelligence and give you a new direction maybe, something that we have been working on. We had a two-year FFG uh, project where we researched a lot in terms of natural language processing and uh, triggering workflows from that and I'll dive a little bit into that and do a couple of demos so maybe something will break down which will also be a lot of fun for everyone involved. Um, but as I'm the last speaker I have to do something with more impact so I hope that Leonard cranks up the volume. I'm throwing in a video I, um, that, that I think kind of kills something of really nice. The outside world. That's why games were invented, that's why humans find it fun to play. There's a rich history of um, computer tackling board games. It started with games like Backgammon, Drafts, and then finally there was Deep Blue in 97 that beat Kasparov at chess. And since then, the really big uh, remaining sort of holy grail, if you like, has been Go. In chess, the number of possible moves is about 20 for the average position. In Go, it's about 200. Another way of viewing the complexity of Go is that the number of possible configurations of the board is more than the number of atoms in the universe. The way I see where we are now is that we've beaten the European champion now, and uh, the next step for us is to try and challenge the legendary player, Lee Sedol, who you can think of as the Roger Federer of Go. Is this humanity's last stand? For a major tournament, pitting E against the AI program AlphaGo gets started on Wednesday. I am still confident that I will win against AlphaGo. But if I understand the algorithm of the program correctly, if artificial intelligence is able to imitate human intuition, it may be a challenge for me to win all five games. I think this looks like, it looks like uh, he is still counting. No, I think he resigned. Wow, I think you're right. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. We have a result. There's our official result. Yeah. All right, well, congratulations uh, to... to to uh, AlphaGo. Because uh, then White, oh, he resigned. It looks like he, Lee Siddle has just resigned, actually. Well, uh, scores another win in a, a dramatic and exciting game. This. The world's best Go player, Lee Sedol, beat the AlphaGo artificial intelligence program in today's match. He had lost all three of the previous games. Lee has topped the world ranking for much of the past decade and confidently predicted an easy victory when he accepted the challenge. I wonder if we have a resignation here. It could be that Lee Sedol has resigned. Yeah, Lee has. I, I'm, I'm getting word Lee has resigned. Yes. So, as you said, I believe a couple we, points uh, behind him. Oh, it's a pity. I, I would have liked to see the counting. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get an official count at some point, but I'm, I'm going to trust Michael's count on this. So I think we're going to be uh, wrapping up. All right, that's too frustrating. Let's, let's move ahead. Um, bottom line, uh, games are the, let's say, the, the highest class of intellect you can throw at anything with your brain. It's how we learn, it's how we evolve as, as people. As you heard that, uh, that game go, if you think about the decision of who you should run over, a child or killing yourself or running against the wall, the decisions that are presented to you in a game of AlphaGo are more than there are atoms in the universe. The best place in the world when describing how they manage to, to do a, a move and go, it basically uh, bring it down to intuition. There is no way, not even for AlphaGo, to really uh, uh, measure out all the, op uh, the options and possibilities coming from a move. So this is a really even almost spiritual game. And we have been beat at it. We have lost. And what does this mean? Um, I think Elon Musk, uh, first thing that guy tweeted, even though he's not in NLP, so, but he's a big name, so let's throw him in here. Uh, he said that artificial intelligence has jumped another 10 years ahead. And a lot of things that we predicted and that we thought would come in terms of how artificial intelligence is attacking also our work force uh, has been moved ahead by a decade. And that's a big problem. And there, uh, I guess everybody watched the Space Odyssey, there are a lot of challenges coming up to us. So my talk is mainly focusing today on how everything that we ever knew is going to end and we are all going to die. 
and then I'll try to, to bring everybody up again. But it's Wednesday, so who cares? Um, uh, yeah, about the German slides, please don't kill me. I will try to translate everything on the go. Um, there has been a study conducted by Frey and Osborne for Oxford uh, looking into the different jobs that are uh, at risk um, in the next 10 years, basically. Um, here's a hint. If anybody just wants to have very secure job, secu like a very secure job, a very nice life where you can settle, basically, in your little woodshed or something, we all have to become woodworkers. They have a bright future. Apparently, it's going to take a long time to... Uh, kill deers and plant trees and so on so it's uh, but I mean uh, I can totally see like a killer deer murder bot that plants some trees and um, yeah but um, what you can see here on the right side there is the high employment uh, uh, um, or uh, the high likeliness to, to become employment uh, unemployed Dios mio. Uh, transportation is the biggest one I think we've uh, talked a lot about this already. There are trucking companies already being set up, and I want to give a broader view on what this exactly means. Um, while this guy is driving an Audi and feeling really comfortable not uh, holding the wheel anymore, there are around 14 million people working in transport, so more than 10% uh, of the whole US workforce, uh, non-farmers, uh, of course farmers not included. Um, the connected industries are also uh, hi highly at risk. So, for example, in trucking, you have 7 million people uh, driving trucks at, at the moment in the US, but only 3.5 million are really sitting inside of a truck. The others are working in garages or have to put uh, packages inside and so on. A lot of logistics are, of course, lost because uh, there are some things you just don't uh, need to calculate in anymore. Um, yeah, there is less need for uh, that many cars. I mean, I, I don't have it right now at the top of my head, but I think you are allowed only to drive for 12 hours as a truck driver, and then you have to make an intermission of at least eight hours. Uh, um, at the moment, there is a very strict law in Europe, for example, meaning uh, uh, there have been different estimations, but around 20 times less cars are needed just uh, in terms of, of moving stuff around. Just think about... Uh, uh, the cars that just are not going to be sold anymore in terms of like car manufacturing companies and so on how many uh, also uh, um, how much employment around um, uh, fixing cars uh, and so on how many park houses are at the loss of course these aren't all factors that we would count in as uh, maybe uh, all too needed or too important, but that's not how it is. The, there are people working day and night on the, in those facilities and then these uh, jobs. It's really hard to translate this on the go, by the way. I'm sorry. Um, another thing which is also at, at risk are uh, less work in hospitals. Uh, at least two million of <laughs> injuries uh, in the US are due to uh, car accidents and so on. If they are reduced and if the cars somehow uh, manage to uh, run over less people, there are still, uh, there's still less work coming in, in a way. And, uh, of course, there are indirect changes uh, by uh, just the general AI economy being blasted with trillions of dollars by people for, uh, like the car industry throwing no money in this area. So there are a lot of indirect factors that contribute to a general movement of the AI scene uh, moving up. I want to also uh, roll back a little bit and uh, not throw that many numbers in. I love these slides because I can just freely speak. Um, there is a story of me. I've, I've been a couple of times in San Francisco, and I've, uh, I have a friend there who works for uh, a prediction algorithm company, one of those things with uh, very long names that fill a whole house, uh, a whole skyscraper somewhere in the, uh, um, in the city center of San Francisco. Um, but the basic bottom line is they... Um, they used certain algorithms to predict how the stock market is going to change and then there was a floor that had to check if those predictions somehow seemed about right and then fill it in. And so they basically invested and that was uh, the thing they did. So uh, one evening he came home and, and uh, uh, to the motel I was staying in and I was like, uh, let's call him Ben. Ben, uh, what's going on? How, how's work doing? And he was like, well, I was working for the last uh, months on a an algorithm that basically is going to put uh, uh, this whole thing where we switch over from the predictions to the stock market is going to do it automatically based on uh, the, less, uh, the, the, the recent predictions and how it turned out. 
And I was like, so, so you basically, like, this guy is working in IT, right? These people seem to be secure for the next few uh, uh, decades. Uh, and he was like, well, um, so, so I practically finished and my whole floor doesn't do anything anymore. I was like, so what did you do? And he's like, I went to the top floor and I'm, I started to build a table because um, I really f always wanted to, do, uh, to build one and it always uh, struck me to do something with my hands. And I just want to give you this picture of somebody replacing around 100 people on a floor in IT with an uh, AI-based uh, uh, algorithm that uh, uh, when it goes up in Silicon Valley on the, uh, on the top ceiling and starts to build a table. It, uh, it goes all back to woodwork, I guess, too, <laughs> in some way. Um, so what can we do against this? How, uh, where is the Terminator in this whole uh, machine uh, uh, story and this whole horror scenario? Um, there is intelligence amplification. And the basic definition or the basic idea is that uh, in contrary to AI doing autonomous work um, around a human without human interference in uh, in the best uh, uh, scenarios, IA is uh, supporting or using algorithms in similar areas to support the uh, human intellect and eliminate redundant uh, uh, tasks. Um, I'm going to dive in a couple of them. Uh, I think one is always uh, funny, uh, one that everybody or at least, oh wait, wait it's IoT, so I guess 30% uh, have it in <laughs> their pocket. If my phone doesn't die on me, uh, I guess everybody knows Siri or Cortana, right? So you can basically ask Siri something, something that you could have done in your phone anyway um, for a long time. But uh, something that everybody should ask once in their lifetime is, let's connect me with the internet. There we go. Maybe you've seen it before. Siri, Siri, what is one trillion to the tenth power? Did it work? It, tries, it wants to update now. <laughs> so every, every Android dev is now like, oh, yeah, there you go. Siri, what is one trillion to the tenth power? Does it work? All right, forget it. Um, something really funny, but that's, I guess, I'm going to do a lot of demo stuff today. Um, the fun fact is uh, Siri starts to beatbox, basically, or it gives you a, a baseline of stuff. But what it basically do, uh, does is it connects to the internet and does some, uh, uh, some amplification of stuff that, would, that you would have done already, right? So you can schedule an appointment and so on uh, and use similar things that, that are already reachable to you uh, to, to improve your current work situation or that to, to at least remove stuff that takes away your daily work time. And the cool thing about intelligence amplification in general is it already works. I have to say it, AI has a lot of cool buzz right now, but 80% of it is not applicable to your life right now. It might uh, uh, take away a lot of jobs and so on, uh, but intelligence amplification on the other hand has a lot more room for failure because it always hands you something where you can say, that's not correct, this is correct, and so on. Um, another thing that I guess a lot of people uh, are talking about recently is bot communication. Microsoft has reintroduced uh, uh, or, or has jumped back into this topic by creating a huge bot uh, 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 network or a platform right now. They are really trying to push this issue. Atlassian is doing the same. IBM Watson is also diving into this. And Facebook uh, recently jumped on the bandwagon again uh, 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 as well. And so I tried out Poncho recently. I wanted to do a demo here just to look at the the... A vast opportunities that you can have, but it kept asking me uh, about South Africa, and so I didn't want to show it anymore. But in general, the the the, the things you can do with those uh, intelligence amplification tools is you can completely uh, 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 assist yourself in the stuff that uh, that you or that that anybody that starts their work uh, uh, at your company on the first day. And all those redundancy has to be removed if we want to eradicate the threat of us uh, losing our jobs. Another one is uh, something where nobody loses their jobs, which is also always good to, to mention. The LAPD had a big problem. They have around 10,000 people uh, employed at the moment. And uh, 
there are a couple of departments that are completely split up, and I want you to think about this for a moment. They're, they have car plate scanners that on the go scan every car that passes them to see how uh, uh, drivers uh, uh, move around during LA. Um, completely disconnected from the other uh, uh, workforce, right? They have 911 uh, 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 calls are not put or weren't put in 2010 on uh, a global network or anything like that. They were physically printed out and had to be handed over. So think about this. You are somebody investigating uh, a bigger uh, 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 crime and you, you had to wait a couple of days for them to physically print out the communication they had. Then there was motor vehicle information, something located somewhere else as well. And then the field interview data. So when you were uh, talking to witness, uh, witnesses and so on, you were uh, having another data set, and all of this was completely disconnected. So they built uh, a task force that was uh, assigned to, to, to work exactly on this process, improve it. And uh, this is something that falls into the ca category of IA because it not, uh, doesn't do something or or Tarkley or something like that, it needs still human input, it needs assistance and that makes it a lot more efficient, uh, uh, makes it a lot more efficient for us in the present. And um, there was a scenario, uh, somebody got uh, murdered on a crime scene and uh, uh, recently and the, the only thing witnesses knew was it was a white Cadillac and they remembered uh, three numbers. And based on this, uh, the, the tool they um, employed and based on the data they uh, brought together, they were able uh, to find a white Cadillac uh, close to the approximate crime scene and, uh, uh, and were able to catch the, uh, the murderer uh, three days, I think, after the crime scene. Stuff that completely fell through the cracks before that. Um, and we are also invested a little bit in the uh, IA thing. It's... Uh, nothing too big. Uh, we are trying to understand what uh, people are saying during a communication, uh, uh, during a conversation. So if I, for example, want my colleague Leo, um, I know, call the IoT team, something you would say. It's really hard to type with five fingers. Do you call the IoT team number is, let's say, oh, and so on. Um, what we would understand is what he's saying and we would provide certain actions to it. So uh, the intelligence amplification here is simply uh, actions popping up and workflows that can be triggered by it. Or if you say, for example, uh, meet me um, on the, let's say, 26th of Jan, and you can write it in any way. It's, of course, a machine learning uh, 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 tool that, um, that gets better the more you throw at it. And the cool thing is, if, you, uh, if this were an uh, AI project, we would try to completely do it automatically, right? But we always present uh, a button. We always have room for choice. And this also means we learn a lot more from it, right? If somebody ignores the button or if somebody decides to, to uh, uh, not follow up with an action that we provide them with, they are capable, to, to, they, they are still uh, uh, giving us information to learn from. And that's something, I think, uh, it's somehow the, let's say it's like the helping wheels uh, on, the, on the bike that is called AI right now. And it's really the one thing that is feasible and allows us to make broader moves and broader decisions. Sorry, I forgot to type this out and everybody's waiting for this. Um, it basically um, yeah, allows you to create a calendar, for example, chip, jump to your calendar tool, to Outlook or wherever and set up a calendar and have everything pre-filled that is, uh, can be derived from it. It also allows you to, to understand stuff like uh, the classic things, are you there? Or like uh, noting what kind of question it is, if it is a yes or no question, if it's actionable or not. Or one of the most important questions in life, I would say, um, Something like that, so you can like create a poll and so on. Um, yeah, um, that's that's uh, the basic drive. I think the ba basic thing you can take away from this is there is a big uh, uh, change coming up, and it's it's at our doorstep. And some of the biggest challenges, of course, the the thing is right. AlphaGo can beat you at Go, but they cannot 
go out and buy groceries right away. So the applicability of all of this is really, it's always really narrow. But this will change as we progress. And one thing that we can do is we can make bolder moves by going into intelligence amplification and uh, um, do a lot more and in, uh, invest a lot more in this area where we can get already results and also something important where we can involve the public already. If you do, uh, uh, if you have an AI project, you can do this in a B2B environment. You can uh, do it in a really closed area. But if you want to make a consumer product, always think about how you can involve them in a way that is still not unsettling to them. And if if you have some way of intelligence amplification that you can apply to this, go down this road because you will learn a lot more and you can create value today in terms of uh, uh, what you can offer to them. Yeah. Um, in general, I think uh, the way we are he uh, heading or the, the direction we are heading at is great. Uh, I, f I really don't think that a human is at the top of their capacity if they have to drive between Graz and Vorarlberg their whole life. I really don't think. I think uh, everybody deserves more. I think the most important question is who is going to benefit from the new optimization? Um, we were a lot uh, uh, we had the same discussions, I guess. I, I wasn't alive in the industrial uh, uh, time period. And uh, before that, everybody worked, I think, 60 hours per week. So there is, uh, there is some kind of uh, uh, improvement maybe around the corner. And maybe everybody will work 25 hours effectively in a couple of years if we uh, find the right impulses and then really ask for our share in this new world that we are heading towards. And I guess that's basically it. Uh, thank you very much and any questions? So, working? Yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? Nothing? I don't want to lose more money, let's get <laughs> oh, one. <laughs> You've seen nothing. How do you see the um near time future for other input channels like speech in intelligence amplification or maybe even in your product um, in general I think uh, getting getting the sentences out of uh, uh, or, or getting the sentences into a machine like through through a voice input is something that has been solved already to a certain degree in certain languages right uh, there's a huge data set uh, that of course every like the Apple has in terms of Siri, right? And uh, there are some some uh, APIs even in the market that would allow you to build anything on top of this uh, within uh, half a week. And so um, deriving anything like the heavy lifting here is more like understanding uh, the speech act, right? So understanding if this if somebody. I, um, ask a question if somebody assigns a to do to somebody and so on so the heavy lifting is out there already and the matter of input is something that has been solved to a certain extent I absolutely agree that or I, I guess uh, your, your, um, I cannot speak for you but I guess there is still room for improvement right and everybody agrees on that I mean I also struggle with Siri occasionally I guess I did just I guess, uh, like 10 minutes ago. So um, I don't think the input will be the problem. Uh, we have enough data uh, for that. We will have to understand uh, clustering a lot better. Every human speaks differently. One of the biggest uh, 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 problems even in human to human conversation, uh, communication is what the other person really means and uh, that's a notion that a uh, human can't predict and machines tend to be a lot more explicit and will uh, if they can ever uh, develop frustration i think it will be in the process of this any other question oh here we go is there um like do you have an idea what um the discrepancy in well in different parts of the world in the reception of um, these new possibilities is, I mean, for example, there's a bunch of people who really don't enjoy talking to their phone. <laughs> uh, like they, they'd rather maybe even, you know, use an old version of Google just because they, so, um, I mean, habit is a big, big factor. Absolutely. And um, so 
so, for example, we at, at some in the 80s we were we would have been able to use a picture phone. The, the technology suddenly was there to use picture phones. Nobody wanted a picture phone. And maybe um, is there maybe do you see some sort of uh, margin of top-notch technology on the one hand that we could use and that it would be so much better, but in reality, we don't want that, and there's like another margin, which of things we do want, and um, like if we realize that, that would be good because then we would actually be able to see what we can sell. <laughs> and um, how far off is that other margin from the the top notch mark. Sorry for talking over you. It wasn't out of uh, disrespect. I was just amazed. These were three awesome questions, and I'm really it's really late, so I'll. You have to tell me again if I forget one. Um, so the, I think the biggest one, uh, uh, um, or, or the one, uh, um, it's really, really a pushing one is how do you change society in general, right? Um, I think the last biggest uh, uh, billion dollar uh, fail in that regard, I guess there have, have been some on the way, was the Google Glasses. Um, they, um, yeah, nobody wants to wear them anymore. I had two at my office. Uh, because our sister startup was was uh, mad about it, and the biggest problem there, in, in terms of changes, is uh, how convenient is it for you to use? And convenience means, uh, I mean, with transportation, it's easy, it's money. And so, if it's in a business scenario and it somehow saves up, uh, let's say. 50% in that regard even, or, or even more, and also a lot of the variety or the risks that you have uh, with humans just being on the job. Um, I guess it's really easy, but if we talk about societal changes, and for I mean, Siri is not used that much. The data, uh, I think, is around 13% or something. It was in the next web recently. Not a lot of people really talk to it, and I think it's most of the time for presentational purposes to talk about intelligence simplification. But uh, the, uh, um, I think one thing people haven't talked that much about is control. And uh, the Google Glasses failed because they didn't give um, the people they, uh, they were used on main, uh, mainly, so the people that weren't wearing them, uh, a, a feeling of how much they're in control. And the biggest societal changes come if everybody involved uh, has the feeling that they, they are still in charge or still understand what is going on. And that's, uh, that's why we, for example, we didn't start with IA. We arrived at IA because... Uh, First of all, we thought everything should be automatically and everything should be put in wherever uh, it's supposed to be. But uh, first of all, it doesn't work because AI is, isn't just there yet in many occasions. In some, there is. So, for example, we are capable of referencing files, right? And the beginning idea was if you talk about any document, we just attach it. And people were running mad about it and they asked us if we are listening to every sentence they say and if we have like some assistant sitting in a cellar somewhere typing it out and searching for it and so on. And it was more convenient to them to press a button to receive the information. And so uh, where I, uh, um, the short version would be, I think uh, the biggest reason why IA uh, is capable of moving forward uh, this whole discussion even, is uh, because the people involved that are using it feel more in control, because they always get some kind of feedback and can decide if they want to use it. And uh, That it, it takes out one variable out, uh, out of the process, and this is fear. And fear has to be removed first. And there were two other questions. You have to help me, or we have to... <laughs> the other question was, like, if, if you visualize this margin like in percentage like suppose 100 percent is like what what you know that the best technology can do and uh, where we are behind be the other margin be that can actually be used and, and that it's actually accepted okay so the variable of how much is out there that has been accepted is around 1%. And it's uh, just because, the, uh, especially in, when it comes to technology, uh, uh, no, I think 1.3% because these are the, uh, how do you call it, the innovators, right? After that, there are 13.6% of, um, let me roll this out, I have it somewhere. Um, it's funny to just improvise and, and drag it out, but I recently looked at this 
I think I can find it on the internet, or maybe I have it in a presentation somewhere. But it's basically the concept or the question of how many people um, are, I think it's, yeah, there we go. Um, uh, how many people are really jumping on it? And I would uh, follow this mass phenomenon to, to maybe describe it the best. And it's that, that thing, right? It's something, that the innovation adoption life cycle. And it, it, it says 2.5%, okay, I uh, was off, well, yeah, forget it. Let's run it down. 30.5% uh, uh, pick it up. Then the early majority arrives somewhere. Uh, now we are at the late majority with Facebook, for example, and uh, now based on technology, uh, just technological limitations, we arrive, uh, for example, in India and so on and, and other uh, emerging markets where in the beginning Facebook wasn't focused on and, wasn't, uh, and just infrastructure wasn't allowing it. So I would file it, uh, file, uh, especially the focus where, where Facebook is now operating the most or growing also the most, uh, would be the laggards, but just in terms of, not in terms of how prone they are to technology, but just uh, how easy it is for them to adapt it, right? Um, by the way, something really interesting, Facebook in, uh, brought in a day of slow internet to their week, so they can completely focus on uh, emerging markets and then have uh, all the developers use Facebook when it's slow as hell. And uh, this uh, led to a lot of crazy cool improvements in terms of compression and in terms of stripping down functionality. Okay, um, I know there's one question. Is it a really short one? <clears throat> maybe, maybe you can just make it uh, bilateral then. Let's, let's make it that you can only ask it in one sentence and I can only answer it in one oh, sentence. Oh, that sounds good. I don't know if you can answer in, in one sentence, but I... That was the I sentence. I will, I, <laughs> I will try to, to reduce the question. What do you think about the acceptance of this? For example, there is a project which uh, is open source, and I, I don't know if you know it, it's Zeitgeist in Linux, which uh, tries to enable a semantic desktop. Mm -hmm. And it, it dies, because the, the, the people don't accept it. I have to add some, something to it to find it. I, I would love to, also for the other people to do. Software, all right. Um, okay, one sentence ask, answer. Um, <laughs> Innovation applicability is based uh, first on revenue, as I stated uh, in our conversation. So um, adaption will lag behind uh, in, 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 in the consumer market. But now, and, and that's the problem with open source projects, because they don't have necessarily the money to lift it up and bring it into a B2B scenario. But this is where something like that is applicable now and where they also actively look for it. So, you know what I mean? Like, uh, if you have an open source project, um, you, you, you uh, sometimes have, uh, it, it stays in a very um, universitary level until it, get, it gets picked up by a larger company. And um, this doesn't mean necessarily that's nothing against open source projects, but it, it always has some derivance uh, at some point where, for example, a company picks it up and then brings it into one of those. Mm. Uh, uh, um, CIO departments and then rolls it out with them. But it's something maybe that would go back and forth for long. As a, yeah. Let's talk afterwards about it. Like. I mean, we are going to have some uh, talks about um, open software and open hardware pretty soon. So we're just in the preparation uh, stage. So um, if, if somebody else is interested, just uh, follow our newsletter. Don't forget to sign up for the newsletter and get in the, the latest information about our next events. But uh, very, thank you again, Felix. It was really interesting. Thank you.